Africa occupies one-fifth of the Earth's land area. Here, deserts rendezvous with oceans. Savannas intersect with rivers. It is a place which more than a billion people from 54 countries call home. The stories we unfold are about Africans and Chinese, how they meet, mingle, and collaborate, and about the future forged in their joined hands. Situated where the equator crosses the prime meridian is the Gulf of Guinea. In the central part of the Gulf lies the coast of Ghana. It's November, and new lives are being conceived. The beaches here are very popular with sea turtles. There are seven types of sea turtles on Earth, and five of them hatch on this coastline. Construction teams from China Harbor Engineering Company are renovating and expanding Tema Port. They're building a new wharf for the old 1980s port construction, aiming to transform it into an important shipping hub for Western Africa. However, the engineers need to take into account the needs of some of the indigenous residents of the beach area. My name is Manasi Aminyabu. I joined the China Harbor as a sea turtle technician. In 2016, when the construction work began, China Harbor hired Manasse to look after the sea turtles. In the beginning, he patrolled a three-kilometer stretch of coastline and set up fences where the sea turtle eggs were discovered. However, with an increasing number of fences along the beach, the passage of construction vehicles was becoming obstructed. Liu Wei is 36. He came to Ghana two years ago. As the deputy project manager, he's responsible for environmental protection. To protect the sea turtles, he's collected their eggs from the beach and set up a secure sea turtle breeding center near the construction site. The engineering team put up a frame it was covered with netting to prevent predators from getting at the sea turtle eggs and to shelter the sand from the sun. The team tried hard to simulate the natural hatching environment by paving on the ground clean, fine and soft sand to create a maternity ward for sea turtles. The eggs will need to be transferred to the new maternity ward. Sea turtles usually lay their eggs at night, and their newborn are very delicate. The sooner the eggs are relocated, the higher the successful hatch rate will be. During the laying period, Manasseh searches the beach for turtle eggs almost every evening. Even if I'm not there and she comes and lay and go away, I'm still able to notice or follow their tracks or the nest area and be able to get the eggs. Artificial incubation requires skill. One burrow for each clutch of eggs. The size and depth of the burrows needs to be carefully calculated. We have to go by the same standard like the turtle comes and does it. With the wet sand inside, and then on the top we use the dry sand to cover it. Sea turtle eggs incubate without the mother turtle. With eggs covered in the sand and an even temperature maintained, young turtles will hatch out of the shell all by themselves. 
In about 50 days, the first batch of sea turtles artificially hatched at Tamer Port should emerge. Land reclamation is a major part of the harbour expansion. The Tianjin Hao is a Chinese-built, state-of-the-art, self-propelled cutter suction dredger. It can suck up 4,500 cubic metres of sand water mixture per day, which is discharged through pipelines two kilometres away to make the foundation for a new container yard. However, if the dredging pipes lay across the beach, they may block the female sea turtles from getting to their nesting sites. To avoid this, the engineering team ran the pipes one meter above the level of the beach. Six weeks on, the dredging for the container yard is nearly done and the first baby sea turtles appear at the breeding center. The infant turtles scamper down the sands and into the sea. They'll wander the oceans for decades before returning to these same waters to mate, and the females will clamber up the beach to deliver the next generation back into the sand. Their memory and homing skills are nothing short of miraculous. It's important to develop the country, and it's also important to protect the animals in the environment too, because they also help us in one way or the other. From the Gulf of Guinea, we head east to Africa's largest freshwater lake, Lake Victoria. On its northern shore sits Kampala, the capital of Uganda. My name is Nabuana Isaac. I'm 45 years old. I'm the director. Also do a camera. I write and I produce movies in Wakariga. Thank you. Isaac Nabwana lives in Wakaliga, a suburb of Kampala. He's previously worked as a welder, a teacher, and a small businessman. Ten years ago, he built a film studio in his yard and became an action movie director. Isaac holds in his hand a Chinese magazine published in the 1990s which serves as the main textbook in his training of actors. I decided to do a movie, Bruce Yu, in respect of Bruce Lee, who taught us about China very much. Yu, meaning Uganda, is a bridge that brings together China and Uganda. Over 2,000 people live in Wakaliga village, but less than 30% of households have access to paid TV channels. Thus, DVDs become the primary source for Isaac and others to learn about Kung Fu. Using magazines in making movies, I mean, also became very difficult for us because these magazines were not coming anymore and uh, you could not easily find a movie in the libraries we have here in Uganda. When the supply of magazines and DVDs dried up, Isaac's film productions ran aground. Wang Yuanbo is a sales manager from China's Star Times Group, assigned to Uganda. Today, he's come to Wakaliga to promote Wan Sun Tong, a satellite TV project. The Wan Sun Tong project was started in 2015 by the Chinese government to make satellite TV available to over 10,000 villages in 25 African countries. In Uganda, 
500 villages will benefit from this program, and Wakaliga, Isaac's hometown, is one of them. Isaac meets with Wang Yuanbo at the roadshow promotion. He's delighted to learn that he can get to see more Chinese Kung Fu on TV, as Wang plans to install satellite receivers in his village. A week later, Wan Sun Tong officially arrived in Wakaliga, and Wang led a team to Isaac's village. Two days on, and the installation of satellite TV receivers in Wakaliga is complete. The receivers can access TV programs from over 440 channels around the world. However, the Chinese Kung Fu channel is clearly going to be Isaac's favorite. I feel happy that uh, I can now get more uh, tactics of making movies uh, from after watching the movies uh, from the satellites uh, because I'm now uh, seeing what the more advanced skilled uh, country like China, how they make it. Another month passes. And Isaac has just finished production on his movie, Bruce Yu. It's highly commended by the Chinese company and becomes the first African Kung Fu movie to be broadcast on the Kung Fu channel. Wang Yuan Bo makes a special trip to Wakaliga for a screening of the movie to locals. Satellites from China is also building a bridge between China and Uganda. As I'm doing, the movies I make, which are also building a bridge, an exchange of, you know, cultures. Two thousand kilometers south of Lake Victoria lies the Zambezi River. It's 2,660 kilometers wind through six countries before flowing out into the Indian Ocean. Zimbabwe's Mana Pools National Park sits on the south bank of its middle reaches. The park covers an area of around 2,000 square kilometers. My name is Nyakomba Zagaria. I am a Zimbabwean and I'm Senior Wildlife Officer Mana Pools National Park. I've been working in this area for nine years, and my main uh, job was under poaching. Neokomba is currently tracking an elephant. The Manapools National Park is home to hundreds of wildlife species. Its highly varied landscape poses a huge challenge to anti-poaching officers like Neokomba. The main difficulties was uh, for resources. Resources were very limited. The likes of vehicles, Abots. Zhang Guangzhou is 34 and comes from Tianjin in northern China. Three years ago, he came to Zimbabwe and became a volunteer in the wildlife service. To help Nyakomba track the elephants, Zhang brought a rigid inflatable boat. Zhang and Nikomba are looking for this particular elephant so they can put a tracking collar on it. The main purpose of collaring elephants is to monitor them because mostly where they are, that's where they will attract poachers to, to kill them. Poaching has been the major cause of a sharp decline in the African elephant population. In the last decade, an average of 30 African elephants have been illegally hunted and killed every day. Nakomba has to find the elephant before the poachers do. Though they've cruised the Zambezi for the entire day, they find no trace. 
Zhang has another solution. He asks his colleague to take Nyokomba up in their microlight. Flying at around 100 meters above the bush should increase their chances of spotting the elephant. The microlight is a piloted aircraft which can cruise at around 100 kilometers an hour. Its maximum flight time is four hours, which is enough to circle the park twice. By flying a microlight, I think uh, in conjunction with the anti-poaching, it is really good uh, since I will be involved in flying this microlight. And uh, it will be good for me to monitor what's really happening on the ground. Nyakamba finally finds his elephant. It was on a shoal 20 kilometers from their takeoff point. After landing, Nyakamba heads to the shoal as fast as possible with the collaring team. The elephant needs to be anesthetized before collaring. This giant bull weighs over seven tons, and if agitated, it will be a disaster. The team moves downwind of it with their tranquilizer gun and await their moment. Once the elephant is lying down, its heart and lungs suffer huge pressure due to its own body weight. So Nyakomba and his colleagues must work quickly. They carefully monitor the elephant's breathing. If there's a problem, they'll need to administer a stimulant and abort their mission. The tracking collar brought by Zhang was donated by Chinese volunteers. It costs around 10,000 US dollars. For the next five years, the collar will continuously transmit the elephant's location to the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. This will allow the anti-poaching patrols to operate in the right areas and protect it more effectively. Zhang Guangrei is just one of the many Chinese volunteers for wildlife conservation. Nowadays, in addition to a complete ban on the ivory trade, the Chinese government donates equipment to a number of wildlife reserves in Africa, gives professional training, and offers technological and financial support to eliminate poaching. We will also act as a link to some volunteers or other Chinese people far away, and also I will act as a link from the Chinese to with my people. An archipelago formed from more than 20 islands lies on Tanzania's Indian Ocean coastline. With a total area of 2,657 square kilometers and a population of 1.4 million people, Zanzibar is today a popular tourist destination. However, medical provisions here have always been somewhat limited. My name is Lam Letasa Nondo. I was born in Zanzibar and I'm working at the Amnesty Moja Hospital at the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology. And I'm a registrar there. Lamlet is 38. She's worked at the hospital for four years. The maternity department only has a dozen medical staff, but sees more than 13,000 births each year. Zanzibar has just 12 public hospitals to serve a total population of 1.4 million and a doctor-patient ratio of one to eight and a half thousand. The Chinese government has sent medical teams to Zanzibar every year since the 1960s. 36-year-old Wang Chao is an obstetrician and gynecologist from Nanjing's Drum Tower Hospital. 
As a member of the 27th Chinese medical team for Zanzibar, she will work at the Nazi Moja Hospital for one year. As well as handling complicated cases, her role will also include helping her counterparts, like Lamlet, improve their medical skills. At 10 a.m., Yocha experiences a sudden increase in blood pressure. Dr. Wang decides that an emergency caesarean is required, as Yocha has severe preeclampsia. The operation lasts half an hour. Yocha's vital signs stabilize and her son is delivered. I'm also a mother, so I know how it feels to be a mother. It makes you want more helping them. Besides treating patients at the hospital, Wen travels to other more remote islands, giving awareness lectures on pregnancy and childbirth. She also offers free clinics to the island's residents. Over the past half century, China has dispatched 21,000 medical personnel to 48 African countries. They share their experience with local medical practitioners, offer medical services to local people, and have treated more than 220 million patients. What they, they, would they decide to come here every two years, it's really incredible to help us, to give us their knowledge, Ethiopia is the most populous landlocked country in the world. Its average altitude of nearly 3,000 meters has seen it dubbed the Roof of Africa. It's also home to the 28-year-old Simret. I'm Simret Araya from Adama. Uh, I'm working as a train staff in Ethiopia Djibouti Railway and Labu Station. In the future, I want to be a captain. Simret works for the Ethiopia Djibouti Railway. It links the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, with Djibouti's capital, Djibouti City, a port on the Red Sea. It's the first transnational electric standard gauge railway in Africa, built by Chinese contractors. All three countries have worked together for four years to complete this project. Recently, Simret got the opportunity to compete with her colleagues for a position as one of Ethiopia's first group of assistant train captains. <laughs> Sing Lola, 21, is responsible for the assessment. Two years ago, he joined Ethiopia Djibouti Railway as a train captain, and one of his responsibilities is to train local staff as attendants. This qualification assessment focuses on the attendant's ability to learn quickly and their service awareness. The first is etiquette. The second part of the test is language proficiency, important on a transnational railway service. The girls need both English and French. Firstly, I thought it was easy, the exam, like always I do. After the exam, it was hard for me, I mean, especially the etiquette, the practical one, and also the oral, French. And then I worried after the exam. Finally, I think it was better to practice, to get a score. Simret is unhappy with her results so far. 
Two days from now, there will be a practical test on the train. This is the most important of all the tests, and it may be her last chance. The Ethiopia Djibouti Railway runs 756 kilometers across the East African Plateau at around 2,400 meters and then down to the Red Sea. The journey takes 12 hours each way. Simret will take her field test on board the train. And just after the train departs, some passengers from Djibouti ask Simret for a place to pray. Person, Muslim person, yeah. they want to pray. Yeah. So uh, do you think we can, we can find a place for them? Okay, well, let's go. Go okay. through it for a The assessors were impressed by the way Simret handled the situation. The Ethiopia Djibouti Railway is one of several Sino African rail projects completed over the past five years. Others include the Mombasa Nairobi Standard Gauge Railway, the Abuja Kaduna Railway, the Abuja Light Rail, and the Addis Ababa Light Rail. Chinese companies have not only built the infrastructure, but also train tens of thousands of professional staff, like Simret, to work on them. Okay, Simret, stand for work. And uh, today you are very good. This is for you a gift. Okay, now you is a captain. From now on, Simret will be Xing Lele's assistant and gradually take over his responsibilities. A Chinese saying goes, With a common will and purpose, no mountain or ocean is impassable. This is true of China's mission in Africa. For many years, China and Africa have been the best of friends, partners and brothers. Currently, China's Belt and Road Initiative fits seamlessly with the development strategies of African nations, bringing together coordinated policies, connected facilities, unimpeded trade, financial integration and people-to-people -people bonds. The comprehensive strategic partnership established between China and its African partners in 2015 has grown rapidly. It is a multi-level and wide-ranging cooperation model that has brought benefits to hundreds of millions of people. Tungawangian,阔步前行,让我们携手努力,汇聚起中非,二十四亿人民的智慧和力量,共同开启中非合作共赢,共同发展的新时代。Yeah.